Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, A Functional Medicine Approach to, to Treating Eczema, the Gut-Skin Connection, led by Dr. Julie Greenberg. Welcome, Dr. Greenberg. Thanks so much, Heather, and thanks to Diagnostic Solutions for having me. Um, and thank you all for joining. I know all of our time is precious and there's a lot of webinars, but I hope I'm gonna give you a lot of good information and a new way to think about treating eczema. So we're gonna talk about the gut-skin connection and, and how I approach treating eczema. And then at the end, we're gonna do a case study and you'll see me apply a GI map and kind of what, what happens to an eczema patient. All right, so um, we'll be talking a lot about the GI map um, and Heather already gave you a very nice intro, so I think we can skip all that. All right, so let's jump into it. Um, let's talk about the pathophysiology of eczema. And I always like to start with the pathophysiology of a disease when you know I'm going to treat it, because that's where and how the body is mal malfunctioning, and we can figure out how we can treat it from a root cause instead of just suppressing symptoms. So what is eczema or atopic dermatitis? And you're gonna hear me use the terms interchangeably. Um, atopic means allergic, dermatitis means skin inflammation, and so the two are used interchangeably. And fundamentally, it is a disease of skin barrier dysfunction, and I think that's obvious. Any of us who have had eczema or treated eczema, we can see there's problems on the skin barrier. But it's a disease of inflammation, and I'm not just talking about inflammation on the skin, I'm talking about deep systemic inflammation, and that's really what we're going to be talking about today. So whenever we talk about inflammation, of course, we have to talk about the immune system. So I'll take you back to medical school, and let's talk a little bit about immunology. And in case it's been a while, um, let's talk about the T helper cells. So we have T cells that are created in the body. And when we first manufacture them, they're called naive cells. And they need to get activated and then be told how to fulfill their destiny and what type of T helper cell to become. And the way that they get activated is through dendritic cells. And dendritic cells are information passing cells from our organ systems that interface with outside world. So we're talking about skin, we're talking about respiratory tract, we're talking, of course, about the gut. And it's like if you breathe in COVID and you get infected, your dendritic cells are gonna pass that information to your immune system. And you know, if you eat something, maybe like potato salad that was sitting out in the sun for too long, you get a little food poisoning, your dendritic cells are gonna tell your system about that. So when we're talking about eczema, um, hopefully most of you are thinking about this TH2 pathway. These are the types of immune cells that we know are really ramped up in eczema or atopic dermatitis. And it's probably not surprising that allergens uh, drive production of TH2 cells, but also worms, when, when we used to get a lot of worm infections, uh, we don't in the Western world anymore, but also fungi, fungi will drive this. And the TH2 um, uh, cell is gonna release cytokines IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. And this is where we really thought we were playing in the eczema space and the entire focus was on TH2. But as we're gonna see in a minute, there's, there's a lot involved, more than just TH2, there's a lot of inflammation. TH22 cells are involved in tissue inflammation. So of course, anybody having a flare, there's gonna be TH22 and not just eczema, but really you know, all, all germ diseases. But interestingly, we've seen, um, we've seen the TH1 and TH17 cells ramped up as well. TH1 are driven by intracellular bacteria, viruses, and protozoa. We're gonna hear about protozoa. And TH17 cells are ramped up by extracellular bacteria, also fungi, and it's happening at mucocutaneous sites. So when I ask patients, you know, think of a site that produces mucus, you know, they all identify the respiratory tract, and that's definitely true. But as we know, uh, the gut is, you know, one of our largest mucocutaneous sites. So we're gonna see TH17 with problems in the gut. And there was a fantastic study that was done in 2019 that really elucidated this. So what they did is, you know, eczema or atopic dermatitis, it's kind of a catch-all bucket. When somebody has a rash and it's kind of nothing else, you put it in the atopic derm bucket. And the ICD-10 code is L30.9. It's kind of like IBS, right? It's kind of everything with gut dysfunction that's not something else goes into IBS. 
But those of us who treat a lot of eczema know that there's really subtypes and that's not discussed as much. So this test was trying to figure that out. And they split the eczema groups into four different cohorts. Those of European American descent, those of Asian American descent, African American descent, and then a pediatric group. And they were lining that up against the psoriasis patients. I hear very often patients will say, well, I don't know, I have eczema or psoriasis. And they're kind of saying it like it's interchangeable. And they're definitely not interchangeable. They're two completely separate diseases with separate pathophysiologies. And we can really see that here in this study. So of course, we said t eczema is a Th2 disease. All the four types of eczema subgroups had elevated Th2. Psoriasis, there's no Th2 in it at all, different disease. And then of course we see Th22, tissue inflammation, you know, high in everybody who's having skin flares. But the really interesting thing was this section with the Th17 and the Th1 cells by subgroup. You know, some of the subgroups like the pediatric were having a huge problem um, with like Th17, um, also the Asian descent group, and others, you know, it was absent and same with Th1. So, you know, going in and testing and seeing what's going on, you can't just make assumptions for all eczema patients because I think as we get more research that it will really be subtyped. So I think the kind of elephant in the room with eczema and naturopathic medicine or functional medicine is the food. And the kind of traditional way of approaching it right now is to run down that path of you know, food testing and food elimination. And I have so many patients who come to me having seen uh, you know, functional medicine doctors and spending months and months on food sensitivity, food allergy, and food elimination. And maybe it helped a little bit, but they're still covered in eczema. And so let's look at some of the myths and some of the realities of eczema and food. So food is a trigger for eczema. Um, it's most commonly a trigger in infants and children with moderate to severe eczema. You know, it's definitely worth investigating. And again, true food allergy is IgE, but it's not likely to be as much of a trigger for older kids and adults. So if you're focused on that for this cohort, you're like missing the big picture. And most kids are gonna outgrow allergies to things like milk, eggs, wheat, and soy but they're much less likely to outgrow allergies to things like peanut, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. Well, what kind of foods are like kind of the highest suspect items if you wanna do elimination diets? Um, here's the five different food items and food groups that are responsible for 75% of food-induced flares. So we've got dairy, egg, wheat, soy, and peanuts. These are a good starting point if you wanna do food elimination. Now, of course, this is 75%, so that still leaves 25%, you know, where other things, and I've seen it all. I've seen everything from, you know, the fruits like mango and citrus fruits to salmon to beef, you know, and it can be dose dependent. And the food, the food triggers can be IgG, IgA, so food sensitivity, or they can be food allergy. But I really don't spend a lot of time testing because I kind of think it ends up being a waste of time and money. You can cut these things out and see how a patient does. And if they're better, great, keep it out. And if they you know, aren't any worse, you can probably keep it in. Dairy is my number one thing. All my eczema patients go off of dairy. I have yet to meet an eczema patient where dairy is doing them any favors. When we ask eczema patients, for you, what do you think makes your eczema worse? Half responded white flour and gluten, so almost the same thing. And half mentioned nightshades. And of course, this is a class of vegetables, things like potatoes and bell, bell peppers, um, potatoes, even goji berries, eggplants. Um, we know the nightshades can cause issues and issues with germs, so psoriasis, there's a lot of issues with nightshades. I think we have a lot left to still unpack with what's going on, and not everybody has issues with the entire class, so you'll, you'll have to experiment with the different foods in the group. So drilling down on gluten a little bit, um, there, get, there was a study that did a wheat challenge, and they took 18 children um, with atopic dermatitis, and they fed them wheat to see if they would flare. And 13 out of 18 did. But 
all 13 had IgE positive antibodies to gliadin or gluten. So this is a true food allergy, right? And those five who didn't flare did not have the IgE positive antibodies. So again, take wheat out. I think it's absolutely worth going gluten-free and giving it a challenge, but the patient really doesn't get any worse, you know, and depending on how much they're tied to wheat, that might not be the area where you really want to focus your attention. So in general with food, I do think it's worth doing an elimination trial of these six foods and food groups, um, and obviously anti-inflammatory foods. So lots of healthy plants and fiber, and if they're not um, reactive to fish, uh, fish oil or fish consumption is a good idea. Okay, so um, something interesting um, is, you know, I see a lot of ear infections in eczema patients, and I always felt like they were food related, and, and dairy came up a lot. And when we took out dairy, I was like, I swear these ear infections are going away, but I can't explain it. So you're going to see this if you treat a lot of eczema. Um, either they had them as kids or you, you're dealing with kids that are getting a lot of ear infections. And, you know, the problem with ear infections is they get prescribed oral antibiotics for it. And that, of course, messes up the gut microbiome. Or they might even need tympanostomy tube insertion, which, you know, that's like a whole surgery. And we know that ear infections are caused by middle ear problems, the eustachian tube. So it never made sense to me. Why in the world is the, why would food be, messing with the ear. And I owe it to Dr. Greg Govitt, who's cited here at the bottom. I went to a conference in the fall. He's an ENT, and I finally got the explanation. And I love when things are explained. It's the embryology. So the first and third pharyngeal arches, which make up the middle ear, are uh, embryologically from the digestive system. And I just thought that was so fascinating. And I, I'm sure you guys also love when things are explained. So this doctor did a really interesting study. He did IgG food testing on 44 of his patients who had tympanostomy tubes inserted, so they had chronic bad ear infections. And these five reactions came up, and lo and behold, cow's milk came up 70% of the time. We also saw gluten, egg, yeast, and soybean. And we can see that four out of these five are four out of the five that I mentioned before tend to trigger eczema. The yeast, I think, is interesting. We're going to talk about candida. Um, when we get to the gut. So do food allergies cause eczema? Yes, no, maybe. The answer is actually maybe, but two thirds of patients with eczema don't show any food allergies or any allergic issues with environmental factors. So not for two thirds. Now, again, I'm not saying that cutting out things like dairy and wheat won't help individuals. It certainly can, but don't get stuck here on the food piece if it's not totally clear and it's not working. We're gonna move on. Now, does eczema cause food allergies? So a lot of people haven't thought about this, but the answer is this does seem likely. Food sensitization is six times more likely to develop in kids who have eczema than those without. And you don't even need eczema, you just need a skin barrier disruption because neonatal skin barrier dysfunction at birth predicts food allergies by the age of two, and kids with skin barrier defects are more likely to develop asthma. So what's going on? It's something called leaky skin. And I'm sure everyone on here has heard of leaky gut, but when we talk about leaky skin, it's a similar phenomenon. So when we look at normal skin, we see an intact skin barrier. Nothing is getting through from the environment. So like dust, mites, viruses, food proteins, it's staying on the outside of the body. It's not coming down here. And as we talked about, here's the dendritic cells. Nothing is being presented to the dendritic cells, so we're not firing up a reaction. But in damaged skin like eczema, we do not have an intact barrier at all. And things do get through, mites, dust, viruses, food proteins. And once it gets down, the dendritic cell is gonna grab it. It's gonna show it to the T cell and prime them and send it on its way. And this is how we get the allergic response to these non-problematic issues. It's an improper priming of the immune system. And this happens a lot in the little ones, especially if they've never seen this before. If the first introduction is through the skin, you're in trouble. And this is not theory. We've actually created this in the lab. So they've done testing on mice and shown this to happen. So they shaved the backs of mice and they did something called tape stripping, which it, it means that they kind of create little eczema on their back. And then they soaked gauze in egg white protein and saline and they taped it to their skin um, on the back for one week intervals. 
and then they gave them a resting period in between. And what we found was they gave them eczema, and just like in eczema, all this increase in inflammatory cells, so eosinophils, right, a TH2 response, mast cells, histamine uh, releasers. And then what we saw was both IgE and IgG specific antibodies to ovalbumin or egg white proteins were increased. So true food allergy and food sensitivity was induced through this skin presentation process and a whole host of inflammatory cytokines. And some of the mice actually had anaphylactic reaction. And eczema is part of what is known as the atopic triad, the allergic triad. So this is what we were looking at, right? Eczema is associated with IgE food allergy and asthma. And a third of all kids with early onset eczema who have that improper priming are gonna go through the atopic march and get either one or both of these issues and stopping eczema early could stop the march. And that could be life-saving because you can die from an asthma attack or an anaphylactic food reaction. So, you know, eczema is serious business. Okay, let's talk about the um, dysbiosis and the leaky gut. Um, so, you know, you tried the food stuff, you got as far as you could. We really want to get to the root cause and that's where we got to go to the gut. So, I know everyone on here is pretty well versed, but just to quickly go over the gut microbiome, you know, the average adult human has about three to five pounds of microbes in their gut, and we are housing and feeding these guys for free. And, you know, for a lot of patients, this is gonna sound kind of crazy. So I explained to them, you know, why do we have these? What are we getting out of this arrangement? Or are they freeloaders that we should kill them all? And of course the answer is no, uh, we can't survive without them. They can't survive without us. It is you know, a commensal relationship that's developed over millions of years. We need each other. They make things we need, things like butyrate, which we're gonna talk about, and they crowd out pathogenic microbes. And they really help maintain that healthy ecosystem in the gut, which you know, 70% of the immune system is from the gut. We want a calm gut and a calm immune system. So the type, there's trillions of organisms in those pounds of um, things living in the gut. Bacteria is certainly the you know, lion's share of it, but there's fungal organisms, viruses, archaea, bacteriophages, protozoa, and worms. We're gonna talk about some of these other organisms today. So I always test and treat the gut. I need to see the digestive function going on, and I need to see uh, the microbiome, and the microbiome all over. And H. pylori included, which lives in the stomach. And we'll be talking about H. pylori. And I like to explain to my patients that the gut really is an ecosystem. And so there are some keystone species, and it's similar to what happens in our environmental ecosystems. So if we think of Yellowstone, right, the wolves are a top predator, and they have been there for millennia. But along came humans and said, oh, you know, we don't like the wolves. We're going to kill them off. And by the 1920s, we had killed the last wolf in Yellowstone. And we congratulated ourselves and thought we'd done something fantastic. Well, of course, as it turns out, we had not. We actually decimated the ecosystem in Yellowstone because the wolf is a keystone species and it belongs there. And it's not bad, it's good. And what happened when the wolves were gone was things like elk completely, the populations exploded, they overgrazed, and all other species were impacted. The rivers even changed course. And a lot of Yellowstone's ecosystem fell apart until we brought back the wolves in 1970 and reestablished these keystone species, and then the system was righted. And the, the same thing can happen in our gut. And again, I won't belabor this slide because I know that you guys who are on here, you know, fundamentally understand this. But, you know, the difference between a healthy gut and a leaky gut can be those keystone species. So for me, when I'm running a GI map, I am always looking for Acromancia mucinophila and Fecalibacterium prosnitzii, and now Roseburia was added. So in case these are new to you, I'll just quickly kind of go through them. Acromancia mucinophila uh, gives us a name. It's Latin, mucinophila is Latin for mucinophile. So I tell my patients, his name is Acromancia I love mucin, or I love mucus. And why acromancia is so important is it lives in that uh, mucosal barrier in our gut that's so important to maintaining the healthy gut. And acromancia will eat some of the old mucus, 
but it will stimulate the goblet cells to produce new mucus. And that's the job of the gut goblet cell is produce fresh new mucus. And so it's a good relationship. We want acromancia in appropriate levels. Eat down the old, that will generate the production of new mucus. And Fecalibacterium presnitzii and Roseburia are butyrate producers. And we're gonna talk about butyrate a little bit more, but keystone species that are essential to a healthy ecosystem. And so I'm trying to assess, you know, are my patients on the healthy gut side? Are they on the leaky gut side? And Fecalibacterium and Acromancia and Roseburia are keystone species I'm looking at. Another marker on the GI map I'm looking at is the secretory IgA or immunoglobulins. I tell my patients they're the Y guys and we can see them doing their job. They find a bad guy and they grab on and deal with it. And a bad guy could be like LPS, which stands for lipopolysaccharide or endotoxins. Um, you know, pathogenic bacteria can gram negative produce um, these endotoxins and can degrade the mucosal barrier. If I don't see Fecalibacterium or it's low, same with Roseburia and Acromancia, and then especially if the secretory IgA is low, I really know that we're over here in a leaky gut. So I'm looking for markers on the GI map to show me if I think there's a leaky gut. And if there's a leaky gut and things are getting through and we have inflammation, this is gonna drive a TH17 response. Um, so this isn't just for eczema, this is for you know, psoriasis and the other diseases that I treat as well, alopecia areata. You have to know what's happening in the gut and deal with the keystone species. In my clinical experience, I do hundreds and hundreds of these. Every patient before I see them, I run a GI map stool test and an organic acid test, and I review the results with them. So I've done hundreds and hundreds of these. And what surprised me, which I didn't expect, is that I started seeing patterns by disease. So my acne patients had a certain set of issues and my eczema patients had a certain set of issues. And now when I look at the labs, I can almost tell you from the labs what kind of skin problems they're having. The number one profile I see in my eczema patient is this. I see high levels of Staph aureus and Streptococcus, which are bacteria, and high levels of Candida. And this can be on the stool test or the organic acid test. And then I see a leaky gut picture, what we just talked about. I see low or no Acromancia and Mucinophila, low or no Fecalibacterium presnitzii and Roseburia, and a lot of times low secretory IgA. So we've got too much and too little of things that we actually need. And then there's a second pattern that's come up and it's this kind of H. pylori and protozoa pattern. So um, is it just me saying that there's gut issues in eczema patients? It's not, there's plenty of research out there in PubMed. And what they're saying is that there's generally lower levels of beneficial gut bacteria like bifidobacteria, bacteroidetes and bacteroides, and higher levels of pathogenic bacteria like Staph aureus, which I see in my patients. Staph aureus is also a big issue on the skin. We're not dealing as much with the skin microbes today. We, we don't have time for that, but Staph is a problem in the gut and on the skin and in the nose. Um, but yeah, there's higher levels of pathogenic bacteria. And C. diff shows up a lot in infant um, eczema guts, not so much in adults. There's also issues with fungal overgrowth. So the literature shows that uh, eczema patients with overgrowth of candida have a correlation with then generating um, high levels of IgE candida albicans antibodies, and that their skin improves when you treat these patients with antifungals. And I 100% see this. Most of my eczema patients have a yeast overgrowth, a lot of times candida, and when I use antifungal herbs, because I don't use pharmaceuticals in my plan, the eczema gets better. There's another issue on the skin with fungal called malassezia yeast. Again, we don't have time to get into it, but there is a correlation with um, that TH17 priming. If you have a lot of candida in the gut, you're gonna prime a response against yeast, and you can get issues with malassezia on the skin. So H. pylori, I mentioned, and just to briefly go through it, it is an endotoxin or an LPS producer. And we know that H. pylori is linked to GI issues like gastritis, peptic ulcers, and gastric cancer, but it's also linked to dermatological diseases, things like in the literature, you see acne, rosacea, urticaria, alopecia areata. I see it a lot in eczema and psoriasis patients as well. And while it is true that, you know, if you sample any 
normal population, anywhere from 30 to 50% can have H. pylori. And I feel like there's a debate in the functional medicine community whether or not it's commensal. For me, it's never commensal. I always treat the H. pylori and I treat it down. And it's one of the reasons why I actually love the GI map because it's standard. This is not an expensive add-on. Every test I run on the GI map is checking for H. pylori and I need that on every patient. So why do I get so bothered about H. pylori? Well, it's so strange bacteria because it's chosen to live in the lining of the stomach. And why that's a problem is that our stomach produces stomach acid and we need stomach acid to digest food, but we also need stomach acid to kill off unwanted organisms that we take in through food, drink, or saliva. I mean, we swallow saliva 2000 times a day we know our mouth isn't sterile, right? You would not want your surgeon to lick your scalpel before cutting in. Definitely not sterile. So how does H. pylori live in all this acid where we thought nothing could survive? It's urease, it's an enzyme, and it combats the acidity of the stomach. It neutralizes the stomach acid and creates a buffer. So while it's true that H. pylori can sometimes called hyper, cause hyperchlorhydria, more often I'm seeing in my derm patients a hypochlorhydria where the stomach acid is too low. And as a result, there's suboptimal digestion um, and suboptimal killing power. And we'll, we'll talk about what I see on, on the stool test from that. And then just to mention protozoa, these are single-celled eukaryotes. Um, the word protozoa means first animal. So these are little animal organisms, single-celled. Um, they can cause gas bloating and GI issues, so also can cause GI effects, and I see this a lot. And again, there's a debate as to whether all protozoa are pathogenic or if some are commensal. Giardia, everyone agrees, is pathogenic. Um, and then you'll see on the GI map, there's another protozoa section with things like Blastocystis hominis and Endolimax nana, Diantamoeba fragilis, and that's where the debate is, okay, maybe these guys aren't so bad. But no, for me, just like H. pylori, all protozoa got to go. And um, I see them a lot in acne patients too. So I treat all H. pylori and all protozoa. And again, I do it with herbs. So what about leaky gut and eczema? Um, you know, do, do I just think that if this is happening? And once again, not surprising. No, it's in the literature. Patients with eczema appear to have increased intestinal permeability or leaky gut. And there's even a positive association between the level of leaky gut and then the severity of the atopic derm. So the worse the gut, the worse the eczema. I 100% concur with this. And, um, you know, we talked about, well, some of these bacteria do good things for us, like Fecalibacterium presnitzii and Roseburia. These are the butyrate producers. So we give them fiber, prebiotics. They are the probiotics living in our gut. They ferment the fiber and they are going to produce things we need like short chain fatty acids such as butyrate. And why we need butyrate is we talk about it a lot for the gut, although there really are benefits from butyrate all over the body. But for the gut, it's the preferred fuel of the enterocytes, the cells of the uh, large intestine. It suppresses immune responses. It really creates a calming inf um, effect on our uh, immune system and it protects us against inflammatory disorders and diseases, and it enforces those tight junctions between um, cells in the gut. So we really need butyrate for a healthy gut. And once again, when we go to the literature, we see this. So it's not just me, there's a whole study, and the title says it all, severity of atopic disease inversely correlates with intestinal microbiota diversity and butyrate producing bacteria. And what they found was that healthy infants and infants with more mild eczema have higher level of butyrate producing bacteria like Fecalibacterium, like Roseburia, compared to those kids with severe eczema. And so, you know, probiotics is gonna always come up with your patients and they're gonna say, I don't know, I'm supplementing my baby with probiotics, but the eczema is not gone. Like it's, a, you know, a magical cure-all. And what does the literature say? Uh, well, there was a systematic review done of 44 studies using probiotics on eczema in 2019. 50% said, yeah, you're going to see a positive effect. 50% said, nope, you aren't. Well, that's a coin toss and that's not particularly helpful. You know, why such conflicting results? I think part of it is because, you know, there's different strains, doses, and courses of probiotics being used. Um, so I think that models it. 
but it's also, I think, way too simplistic to think that just getting a strain of a probiotic in there is going to fix something as complicated and multifactorial as eczema is, and it rarely is. Again, sometimes, yes, there are certainly cases where people take a probiotic and it clears, and that's great, but the majority of people, that this is not going to be their winning ticket. You got to do a lot more, and I do use probiotics, but part of a robust protocol. So, of course, our goal of functional and naturopathic medicine, we don't want to just treat symptoms, right? We can do that with topical steroids, but that's not the goal. We want to get down deep to the root causes, and we want to treat the root cause and get rid of this issue for patients and let them move on with their life, not on suppressive or immunosuppressive medications. So my method is go after the gut dysbiosis. It is driving systemic inflammation and systemic inflammation is the driver of chronic dermatological disease. So we test and treat the gut. Okay, so let's do it. Let's test the poo and see what happens. And you know what? A lot of patients actually come to me like pretty excited to, to test their gut because they, they inherently know, right? They're looking for us. They want somebody who's not gonna hand them a tube of steroid and is gonna help them get to the root cause of this. So, you know, there's lots of different types of functional medicine tests, and I do do a lot of these different tests. Um, but my starting point, as I mentioned, they got to run a GI MAP stool test and an organic acid test. We got to see the picture in the gut. And the stool testing, we're going to get both pathogen and commensal organisms, and we need both. So for bacteria, like I said, you're going to get the H. pylori, you're going to get commensal or normal bacteria, opportunistic, pathogenic bacteria. Um, there's a, f a fungi and yeast section. There's a parasite section, which I need the protozoa. Worms are pretty rare, but protozoa show up. And viruses are on there, pretty rare in my for my cohort. Um, digestive markers, steatocrit. It's showing you how much fat is in the stool. And for me, this is a good proxy. If there's not enough fat in the stool, then I'm thinking there's a problem with bile. The gallbladder might not be injecting enough bile, and a lot of times that's a sign of hypochlorhydria due to H. pylori. And elastase as well, it's this pancreatic enzyme, same thing. If there's H. pylori and either the steatocrit is high or the elastase is low, I am really thinking hypochlorhydria, and I can support them with you know, various um, enzymes and stuff while I'm clearing the H. pylori. There's markers of inflammation on the GI map. So there's calprotectin, colonic inflammation, and that secretory IgA or YGI that we went over. And you can add on zonulin and do permeability markers. I don't, I don't find that I need it because I'm, again, kind of looking at leaky gut and the markers I went over before. So I am really using the labs as my roadmap. I know where we're starting because we can, that's the great thing about Derm. You can see the problem and you, you know, you can see the end because it's clear skin. And how I'm going to get there is by treating what I see come up on the GI map and the organic acid. So let's do a case study and see, you know, how do we actually put this together to treat a patient and what kind of um, effects can you actually expect from using this method? So we're going to look at Tina, and of course, you know, Tina is, is not her real name, um, but we'll call her Tina. She's a 34-year-old female. I think it's pretty obvious what the problem is. She's got eczema, but she's had eczema since infancy. So she's struggled with this her whole life. And for the past 15 years, she's been using tacrolimus on her eyes and face. So tacrolimus is a calcineurin inhibitor. It's one of the most common topicals used in eczema. And then for the past six months, the eczema has completely gone crazy, and she has been prescribed hydrocortisone, triamcinolone, fluocinonide, betamethasone, clobetazole, and montelukast. These first five are all topical steroids, starting from a class seven and working up to a class one. Clobetazole is the class one. That is the most potent steroid. Clobetazole is 600 times the strength of hydrocortisone. And this is what you will see with your eczema patients. They get stepped up from a lower potency to higher potency and higher potency until you end up on clobetazole. And this is just such potent stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's not great. And Montelukas is a leukotriene inhibitor. But we can see it's not working. Even clobetazole, she has severe eczema all over her body. She cannot work. She has lost her job. Eczema can be this severe. 
And so my next steps are, I'm gonna run a GI map on her, I'm gonna run an organic acid test, and then I can see how I can help her. And when I say she had it all over her body, I mean, she had it all over her body. Like usually I can fit the areas onto that first slide and this isn't even all of it, but just to give you a picture, I mean, it's just everywhere. I think you can see why she can't work like this. I mean, she's just tearing at her skin. She can't sleep. It's, it's really a nightmare for people. Okay, so what are the significance findings on the GI map? So H. pylori, here we go. And if you're not that you know familiar with the GI map, I'll give you kind of a little insight how to read it. So 1.0 E3 is 1.0 times 10 to the third power. So if we move the decimal point three places, it's 1,000. The cutoff is 1,000. So for me, this, this is high. But again, any, any value in H. pylori I treat. I will tell you that uh, most of my acne patients have H. pylori, and it's in the hundreds. It's an E2. You clean up the H. pylori, good things happen. So she's got H. pylori. For the normal bacteria section, there's a lot of different things going on. I used, and, and I'll say that, um, so that the way that the GI map is presented has changed as of August of 2022. So this was done prior to that, and now it'll look a little bit different. I, I like the new one better, but it's basically the same things. So my first thing is I'm gonna go to Acromancia and Fecalibacterium. Now there's Roseburia, that wasn't there at the time of this test. But we see Acromancia mucinophila has this little sign, and what this means is below detectable limits. That means not there. Acromancia was not found. So now I know we have trouble and we're likely in the leaky gut. And then we see a combination of like some red highs and then some kind of yellow lows. And I walk my patients through their labs and I kind of split it into two sections. So first we drop down to the phyla. And these two phyla of Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes, phyla is like, you know, a big kind of uh, classification. Um, these are showing us maybe about 85% of the good or more commensal bacteria in our gut. The problem is when some of these good guys get high, they can become more, you know, dysbiotic, not so good. And we can see she has a lot of overgrowth. And this, this happens with my H. pylori patients with hypochlorhydria. It, there just gets to be an overgrowth of everything. So I don't want high levels, even though we're in the normal. Um, and then, you know, some stuff is low. But the biggest problem is the lack of acromancia and then the super high kind of overall numbers. The next section is the opportunistic. So some of these I don't mind so much, other ones I don't want to see. Well, what do we see? Kind of classic, my eczema gut. We see staph aureus and strep are high. And this is very common, particularly in my eczema patients. But what's interesting is Morganella is high, really high, an E7. So I think that's times 10 million, or a million, or 10, maybe a million. Um, I don't like to see any Morganella. Morganella is a high histamine producer. So a lot of eczema patients who are itching and already have a high level of histamine, you're gonna see high histamine producers um, in their gut like Morganella and Citrobacter and Klebsiella, they're gonna come up high. This is exacerbating the problem. I need to get rid of the Morganella. And parasites. So here we go. We got Blastocystis hominis and it's just a protozoa party in her gut. Again, some people find Blastocystis is okay. It's never okay for me. I'm gonna treat all H. pylori and all protozoa. And I did an analysis of my acne patients um, and Almost all my acne patients have H. pylori and half of them have protozoa, but I almost only ever see protozoa in patients with H. pylori. So I really think it's that picture of hypochlorhydria and then the protozoa don't die in the stomach and they can get out and proliferate. So I gotta treat these. And then her anti-gliadin IgA, so that one of the markers for gluten sensitivity is really quite high. So this is telling me, yes, she's probably one of those eczema people where she really does need to take out gluten. It's, it's gonna be part of the picture, right? Nothing is, is everything, right? It's like a puzzle, we're trying to piece it together. And all of these are pieces that are causing her to look the way she did, and I gotta clean up all of them. On her organic acid test, the arabinose was high. That is the marker for candida. So she's just very much a classic eczema gut patient. And oxalic acid gets high with candida as well. Okay, so what am I gonna do to help Tina? Now I've, I've run the labs, I've analyzed the labs, I have my information, how do I help her? Well, first, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, what's your eczema protocol? And 
you know, true to naturopathic and functional medicine, these are individualized protocols. This is why even though I see patterns by disease, I need to run the GI map and an organic acid test on every patient because I don't know what all the issues are in the patient in front of me until I run the labs. So they're individualized protocols. And I see patients about every two and a half months. So the plans are gonna change and I'm working through different issues. I'm taking like, you know, the most important ones at the beginning and then, you know, that's part of the skill as a clinician is, you know, how much can you do? How much can this person handle? So this, everything you're gonna see was not done all in one batch. This was done, you know, over protocols and we're gonna see pictures at each stage. So in general, you know, again, I don't treat with pharmaceuticals, so I'm treating H. pylori with herbal things like masticum, DGL, black cumin seed, or tea blends, um, a whole host of antibacterial herbs, so things like coptis, you know, an organ grape, olive leaf, um, garlic, and I'm a big proponent. I like herbal blends. Um, our antifungal herbs, I love rosemary, powder arco, uber ursi our antiprotozoals like artemisia and black walnut. Um, she didn't have acromancia. There is an acromancia probiotic that's available now. I am doing general support. So, you know, multivitamin, I like spore-based probiotics in my adult patients with eczema. All my patients were working on fiber. So for adults, we're working on getting 35 grams of fiber a day, right? Those are the prebiotics that are gonna feed the commensal organisms and maintain a healthy gut after we're done. And she's coming off of gluten because of that um, anti and IgA. And then I do do a lot of skin barrier support. Again, we don't, you know, have time to drill into the skin side today, but, you know, I've, I've cleaned up patients just with, with gut work. So I prefer to do both, but the gut is really the source of the problem. Okay. So what happened to Portina? So this was her at the first visit, and we'll look at just a couple different areas on her body. Two months after starting the plan, uh, both oral and topical. Uh, this is how Tina looks. We are seeing a whole different world, right? We can still see that the skin has been traumatized, but it is not this, like she is on her way. Three months later, so she does another protocol, she comes back and that kind of redness is gone, but you know, there is some like hyper and hypopigmentation. And then two months after that, so seven, seven months of treatment. On her stomach, we see these lesions, Again, at two months, things are much, much better, starting to now repair the skin. And now, you know, we're really not seeing much happening in this area. On the hand, um, a huge amount of cleanup, but there's, yes, discoloration. You can kind of see things getting healed. And then um, both of the back of her knees, the popliteal fossas were like this. This is like henified skin from chronic itching, they are being tortured by itch and adults and infants will scratch themselves until they bleed because pain is better than itch when it comes to eczema. And, and that leads to this like henified thickened tissue. Two and a half months, you know, it's not perfect, but it's getting a lot better. And then here the inflammation is gone, but we have residual post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, but by two months it's gone. And this patient is um, what's known as a skin of color patient. And in particular, your patients who are melanin rich or skin of color, they are gonna be very concerned about the tone and whether the hyper and hypopigmentation is permanent. I can say that to this date, if you can clear up the issues and it doesn't matter if it's acne, psoriasis, eczema or whatever, the skin tone will resolve and go back to normal. And so I can really kind of ease my patients of mine who are skin of color that like, once we get this, don't worry, you're not gonna be permanently having like discoloration on your skin. And, you know, Tina cried at the first visit cause she was, you know, her life was really on hold. And she cried, you know, at that last visit. And she said, you know, I couldn't imagine a life without eczema before. She's lived with it her whole life. I didn't realize how much of my mental space and energy eczema took up. Now I feel free, you changed my life, thank you. And it's really meaningful to treat derm patients. It's not just a you know cosmetic vanity thing. These patients are really suffering and you can really change their lives. And they are some of the best, most compliant, most grateful patients out there. So I love treating derm. So what are some things to consider? Um, if you're treating skin, think of the gut. I, I run these on all of my patients, whatever the issue is, including alopecia areata, which is an autoimmune attack on the hair fall. 
um, you have to analyze all the problems that you need to address from the lab. So I get the results and I'm like, okay, here's all the problems I need to fix. And then decide what order you want to treat them in. You can't treat everything all at once. You got to like pick your battles and then work through them. You, of course, you need to learn the best protocols to treat all of them oral and topical and adjust based on your patient. And um, I, I like to move through different protocols about every two to three months. And then I treat beyond skin clearance. And what that means is that their skin may not have the issue anymore, but based on what I saw in the labs initially, I know now that I have to keep treating it. Because at first when I was kind of creating this method, as soon as their skin would clear, I thought, oh, we're done. But it's that concept of you know the bucket filling up. And I had just lowered the bucket enough below the, the lid so it wasn't overflowing and the acne or the eczema wasn't coming out. But if I let them go at that point, a lot of patients were getting back on my schedule within like six months. So I realized I have to really treat down all the issues. And then sometimes I'll rerun labs at the end, depending on patient finances. Okay, we saw it work on a case of eczema. Does it work on other dermatologic conditions? Well, this is my methodology for treating all of these issues. It works on acne, um, really severe acne and mild. It works on all kinds of eczema, infant eczema to adult eczema, as you've seen. And this is teenage eczema, scratching like identification, and the hand eczema, which really exploded after COVID. Um, this is a case of um, eczema, uh, eczema herpeticum over barriers disease, uh, psoriasis, and again, real severe stuff, stuff that even biologics isn't touching. This is a different psoriasis patient. Um, this is gutate psoriasis on the back. This is a palmoplantar pustulosis, a form of psoriasis. Uh, it works on dandruff, seborrheic dermatitis, alopecia areata, rosacea, everything I treat. Um, I'm gonna try to get to as many questions as I can today, but if I don't, here's my contact information. Um, I'm at the Center for Integrative and Naturopathic Dermatology. Uh, so you can reach me at contact at integrativedermatologycenter.com. And if I'm unable to get to your question today, just send me an email and um, I promise I will get back to you. And um, anyone who's gonna be at the Integrative Healthcare Symposium in two weeks, I am speaking there on Saturday, February 25th at a 10 a.m. session. And I'll be kind of breaking down acne uh, this, in that talk similar to the way I've broken down eczema and doing a couple case studies on that. So you're welcome to come see me. Diagnostic Solutions is gonna be there as well. So if you're interested in talking to somebody about the GI map, you can stop by their booth. And then the last thing I wanna mention before I take questions is I've launched a new course, the Root Cause Functional Dermatology Professional course. This is just for uh, like licensed healthcare professionals. And I'm teaching other providers how to do this. And we're gonna be doing intensive training. It's a four month course. Um, and there's gonna be intensive training on the functional, how to analyze and treat based off the lab. So of course, we'll be doing the GI map. We'll be doing organic acid tests, mycotoxin tests, fetch tests, and many more. And then I'll be showing very specifically, so there's no CME in this and that's on purpose because I wanna show you the exact protocols. Like what did I give Tina after that first plan, orally and topically? What did I give her that produced those results for the second visit? Here are the brands, here are the doses, here's how long she was on all the things. Um, so I'm showing everything. And we'll be discussing how to treat acne, eczema, seborrheic dermatitis, so that includes dandruff, cradle cap, and skin subderm, psoriasis, hair loss, I treat you know, H. pylori and SIBO and much, much more. And we're forming a cohort. Uh, recorded content will drop at the start of every week and then there'll be live sessions every other week. And it's really gonna be um, a foundational group of providers. For some reason, there's just really not a lot of uh, functional medicine practitioners who specialize in medical dermatology. So this is the inaugural course and the goal is to get this group going and really grow out this space. It's a fantastic space. It's so rewarding. And if you're looking for a specialty and you feel like your calendar isn't full, um, this is the course for you. Uh, there's so much need for it. I literally get emails every day just this morning, somebody wanting to fly in from Australia to see me. I don't do that. And I really need to train other providers. Um, there are 50 million people in the States alone with um, acne, 50 million with dandruff, 30 million with eczema. 
There are so many people that need this help, and as you can see, it really works. So if you're interested, head over to rootcausedermatology.com, and you can fill out a form on the medical professional course. You'll be able to download a PDF, and you can schedule uh, 10 minutes to chat with me, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about the course, and you'll get a lot more information from that PDF. And uh, that's all I have. So um, I don't know if Heather, I think you're the one asking questions, or Andrea, yeah. if there are Actually, questions. We yeah, we do. Um, actually, it was really informative. I, I found it fascinating myself. Uh, question. Did the patient in the case study, Tina, did she have candida? Yes. So that was in the um, organic acid test. Arabinose is the marker for candida. I did not see candida on the stool test. Um, a lot of times, the unless the fungal stuff is living kind of close to the back end, the anus, I won't see it, which is one of the reasons why I run the organic acid test. When I do see the fungal at the on the stool test, um, a lot of times I'll, I'll ask patients like, do you have anal itching? And they'll have issues with like anal um, itching. It's from the candida. And if it's female patients, a lot of them will have like um, candida, like vaginal yeast infections and stuff too. So yes, this patient had candida overgrowth. All right. And do you have a general protocol for leaky gut? I mean, again, I'm, I'm treating what I see. So for me, you know, to treat the leaky gut, um, I have to look at, you know, if, if the acromancia is not there, I'm going to be giving some acromancia. If the fecalibacterium and roseburia are not there, I will give I have I use butyrate supplements while I'm waiting to regrow and to regrow those commensal organisms we're working on for adults 35 grams of fiber a day. There's also prebiotic blends that are good that are um, a lot of good prebiotics that grow acromancia and beneficial gut flora or things like there's cranberry pomegranate blueberry blends things like that but you know the diet working on um, not eating the inflammatory foods and eating a lot of fiber. Um, if the low, if the secretory IgA is low, there are supplements with um, you can um, supplement with the immunoglobulins. Most of them have IgM, IgG, and IgA in the formulas. But I'm trying to heal the gut, so I might use you know gut healing blends with like you know slippery elm and marshmallow root and DGL and stuff like that. So I'm definitely doing things to heal the leaky gut, and then ultimately. I'm trying to, you know, from the minute a patient gets on my schedule, my goal is to get them off. I want to heal their condition and have educated them to how to keep their gut healthy. So, you know, fiber and, and diet and lifestyle is always going to be fundamental. But at the beginning, yes, I have very robust um, supplement protocols and I have amazing compliance because if patients are getting results, they will follow what you're saying. And, you know, if you, if you heal this up, yeah. So, yeah, but, you know, the leaky gut, and I'll be teaching how to treat le leaky gut, you know, more specifically. In the course, we'll be doing probably about 30 cases. It's a case-based method, so we'll keep looking at, like, five to six of my patients, and you'll see actually, like, what did I give them and how did it work, and um, so by the end, everyone will be an expert in the GI map, organic acids, and how to treat these conditions. All right. Next one, how do you treat staph aureus on GI map? Yeah, so staph aureus, um, it's, um, so like I said, so staph aureus is, is a huge problem in eczema. We didn't get into the topicals. Staph is usually overgrown on the skin. Staph colonizes the nose and we see staph in the gut. I know, you know, the tendency is like to look at the individual bacteria, and sometimes I do, like with Morganella, one of the histamine producers we saw, like Meadowsweet can be good for Morganella, but with Staph aureus, it's just such a general one that those kind of general antibacterial herbs that I showed you, I mean, you know, garlic and oregano and, you know, berberines and all that stuff, it will take care of the staph. The Staph aureus in the gut is that not that hard to get at. You do need to get it on the skin and in the nose. So I do use like colloidal uh, silver or like propolis or essential oil nasal sprays to get rid of the staph aureus nasal colonization. And then I use the skin is like a whole different thing, but I use a combination of topicals. Um, the skin pH naturally is acidic and in eczema, the skin pH is off and it becomes more neutral. And if you can pull the skin pH back down, staph aureus, does not thrive. So you can do things like 
apple cider vinegar and water or hydrosols and you can use you know antimicrobial herbs on the skin and you can use you know depending on the patient um topical you know oils or saps with essential oils so you really need to pay attention to the staph aureus in all places and again i know i'm sorry we just there's just not time to do like a skin thing but i teach all the skin protocols as well when you treat h pylori is your goal to optimize numbers or eradicate it and then how do you treat it i'm sorry if when i treat what h pylori oh h pylori is my goal to eradicate it yes Definitely. I want to get rid of H. pylori. H. pylori is so stubborn, um, you know, for conventional and for, um, you know, more alternative like herbal treatments. You know, we used to have what was called triple therapy for H. pylori and then H. pylori became resistant to that. So now it's quadruple therapy in conventional medicine. And it's a combination of antibiotics and PPIs and, you know, all sorts of bismuth and all sorts of things. Um, it takes a lot to get rid of the H. pylori, and then you have the problem that people that, that they're living with can be infected with H. pylori and give it back to them. So if it's clearing and then coming back again, the other people in the household may need to look at getting treated as well. But I want to treat H. pylori down to zero. Um, I just find that it's doing no good. And originally when i was kind of like ignoring and leaving you know the lower values as we would retest i mean i would just see the h pylori going up and up so it's like why not treat it before it's super high if you can get it at that point so yeah i'm, I'm treating to clearance all right what is a good level of cedaric on gi map yeah so just to remind you guys this deadocrit is the amount of fat in the stool i think that the cutoff um on the lab, it's like a 15%, meaning that like by conventional laboratory standards, 15%, you could have like a certain amount of fat in the stool. Normal for me is zero. I wanna see no fat in the stool because that means that they're fully digesting their meals with fat and they're not putting it in the poop. Now, there are kinds like if, if you have a patient doing keto or you know fat bombs, maybe they're consuming so much fat that that just the body can't use it and, and that will go into the stool. But my patients aren't on a keto diet. So I wanna see steatocrit is zero and I wanna see elastase over 500. The elastase are the pancreatic enzymes. For me, that's, that's optimal digestive function when I'm thinking about bile and pancreatic enzymes. All right, we got room for our time for one more. In some patients, why does eczema only occur on certain parts of the body? Yeah, it's a great question. I actually talk about this when I lecture on the skin stuff, but I'll try to give you the quick and dirty. Um, okay, so there's two, there's kind of two zones. For infants, we see it on the cheeks, and you saw a patient with a, a little infant with cheek eczema. But then when kids get older and adults, we really don't see eczema on the cheek. And for a long time, we did not understand that at all. And now we know, so there's a protein in the skin called filaggrin, and I do a whole thing on this. It's really important when it comes to eczema. Filaggrin is um, the master regulator of the skin barrier, and it breaks down into a substance called natural moisturizing factor. That pretty much explains what it does. It creates nice, healthy, moisturized skin. It also creates acidic skin. And um, what we discovered is that different spots on the body from infancy, it takes different amounts of time to re reach mature levels. So for example, the tip of the nose, pretty early on in infancy, this area of the body reaches mature levels of natural moisturizing factor. And I know uh, we don't have time to get into it, but that protects you from staph aureus. The cheeks, it can take until age seven for this to reach maturity, which means you're, they're deficient in it. And with the baby, you're also throwing saliva and food on their cheeks half the time. So you're, comp you're really working on an already compromised barrier and staph can really take hold and, and work with compromised skin. So we see this in infants due to that lack of mature natural moisturizing factor. It goes away by age seven, usually far beyond that. In older populations, we see it in the antecubital fossas, so the crook of the elbow and popliteal fossas behind the knee. This is my theory, but I show this whole map of like the skin microbiome. And staphylococcus, which 
there's a lot of different types of staff, but staph aureus obviously is in staphylococcus. When you look at like where does it naturally colonize on the body, it is a heavy colonizer of the anticubital and popliteal fossas. So I think there's a combination of thin skin and maybe not as much filaggrin and natural moisturizing factor, and the fact that staph seems to hang out in those areas. So if something is gonna go wrong, it's like the first place that's gonna colonize and the last place to clear. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting when the study finally came out and we understood infant cheek eczema and what was going on. That is really interesting. Well, Dr. Greenberg, we're out of time today. I appreciate you doing this with us today. And if anybody has any questions about any of the other products that Diagnostic Solutions Laboratories offer, you can go to our website, which is diagnosticsolutionslab.com. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. And thank you, Dr. Greenberg. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye.